Good afternoon and welcome to this introductory webinar on the recently adopted Committee of Ministers recommendation on the importance of plurilingual and intercultural education for democratic culture. My name is Sarah Breslam and I'm the Executive Director of the European Centre for Modern Languages of the Council of Europe. It's my pleasure to be with you today and to know that many of my colleagues from the ECML Governing Board who are here in Graz for their annual meeting are also taking part in this webinar. I know that many of you are also taking part from across Europe and beyond. There's a lot to cover in the webinar, but I also hope there will be time for some questions. And I'd like to begin um, because this is the first in a series of webinars by giving you a brief overview of what I would like to cover. I think it's important to set the scene, to talk a little bit about the Council of Europe and how, what is a recommendation, why we have such instruments, to think about the rationale for the recommendation, why did the Council of Europe decide to develop this tool, what are the key features, what makes it different from previous recommendations, think a little bit about ownership. This is, of course, a recommendation to member states. So the role of member states and their implication, both in the development and the implementation um, um, is absolutely essential. I'll give you a brief overview of the structure of the actual text and the functions of the different elements, because it is quite a dense text um, and that will help you to get your, your head around it. And then I would like to spend a little bit more time in thinking about practical ways for you in your different national contexts to think about promoting and implementing uh, this very important tool. And then I'll conclude with an outline of what future webinars in this series uh, will cover. So first of all, just a few words about the Council of Europe. Let me just begin to point out that the Council of Europe is Europe's leading human rights organization and the oldest intergovernmental political organization comprising 46 member states and 7 million people. The Council of Europe aims to promote democracy and protect human rights and the rule of law. All member states have signed the European Convention on Human Rights. And it's through the development of such conventions and charters, for example, the Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, or the Convention on Cybercrime, that it promotes human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. In addition, of course, to these legally binding instruments, the Council develops recommendations. The key is in the name. They're recommendations, they're not legally binding, but once they've been adopted, the idea is that there is commitment from the member states for their implementation. In addition to the development of such important instruments, the Council of Europe works through cooperation and capacity building projects with its member states. And in fact, I would say the development of this recommendation exemplifies such a multilateral approach to cooperation. It's very easy to confuse the Council of Europe with other European bodies. The Council of Europe is not the European Council. The European Council is the decision-making making body of the European Union. The European Union has 27 member states, and no country has ever joined the European Union without first being a member of the Council of Europe. So, two separate organisations but with complementary tasks and with a strategic partnership. This is also true for the ECML. Since 2013, we've been working in direct cooperation with the European Commission. But why do I point this out? Because this recommendation is a Council of Europe recommendation and therefore is valid for 46 countries. Just as the European Council is the decision-making body of the EU, the Committee of Ministers is the decision-making body of the Council of Europe. On February the 2nd this year, the Committee of Ministers adopted this new recommendation in the field of language education. 
What does that mean? It means that all foreign ministers of the, at that time, still 47 member states of the Council of Europe, endorsed the recommendation and committed themselves to implementing it in their respective countries. It's now time to take that commitment seriously. But Council of Europe recommendations are of a particular genre, and they all follow a similar structure, which I've outlined on the following slide. You can see that there are four parts, three parts which are official um, elements and the final part, the explanatory memorandum, which is optional. I'm not going to go through this slide in detail, but I think it helps you understand the different elements within the recommendation. And I will be going back to them um, in a moment. But why a new recommendation? What's the point and why now? Well, any new recommendation is developed when the Council of Europe recognises that we have a common European challenge and it decides to develop this new policy instrument, not only to put that challenge on the political agenda, but also to give impetus to all member states to work towards solving the problem. So what problem or what problems are we talking about? And with that, I'd like to turn to the rationale for the recommendation. And I'd like to begin this section by looking in more detail at the title of the recommendation. What's in a name? Let's look at the first part of the title. Recommendation on the importance of plurilingual and intercultural education. It's a concept or even a construct, because it's very complex, which has been used by the Council of Europe for many, many years now. I suspect many of you listening are familiar with it. Perhaps you use it in your own context. But does it mean that it's a construct that we all fully understand and fully commit to? Today's not the time to go into detail in it, but one fundamental point I think is worth making. This construct requires a fundamental rethink of all aspects of language education, not only within school systems, but in higher education, in language support in the workplace and in informal learning contexts. And that rethink is one that influences all sorts of different levels, policy, teacher education, institutional management, the wider school community, right down to approaches to teaching practice in classrooms. And here again, not just in language classrooms, but right across the curriculum. And we'll soon see how this all encompassing aspect of the construct of plurilingual and intercultural education is reflected in the recommendation itself. I mentioned before that the Council of Europe develops recommendations to address specific challenges or problems. So what ones is this one trying to address? Two specific developments of concern, a tendency on the part of public authorities and civil society to think that proficiency in one additional language is enough, as long as that language is English. I think we all know that the promotion of English however important it may be, has inadvertently led to um, the detriment of the promotion of other languages. And this is really a challenge for us. And what about the second um, issue that it's trying to address? The populist notion that proficiency in minority or migrant languages, widespread in today's increasingly diverse societies, is harmful to societal cohesion. I wonder, are these issues openly acknowledged in your different contexts, or are they perhaps just lingering there in the background, the sort of elephants in the room that we don't really speak about, but that we all know we need to address? Now, you may have noticed that I haven't included the full title in this particular slide. So let's now look at the second part of the title. Recommendation on the importance of plurilingual and intercultural education for democratic culture. 
The two specific challenges just mentioned are part of a much bigger concern, and that is the backsliding of democracy, as highlighted by the Secretary General of the Council of Europe in her 2021 annual report. She talks about a rise in xenophobia, racism and populist nationalism. These issues were already present in our societies even before the advent of COVID, but I think we all know that COVID has had a very negative effect on plurilingualism, multilingualism, respect for linguistic and cultural diversities, and in some ways has widened every existing gap, societal, economic, linguistic. And of course, the most recent example of an attack on democracy is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. All of which for me makes this recommendation even more timely. It's true that democracy cannot exist without democratic institutions, universal suffrage, free elections. But these institutions will not work in practice if we as citizens ourselves question democratic values and attitudes and are not willing to participate in democratic processes. And this is where education and language education come into play. For the Council of Europe, education is not about preparation for the labour market only. It also is about the development of the person, preparation for life as an active citizen in democratic societies. And to promote these democratic attitudes and values through education, the Council of Europe has developed the reference framework of competences for a democratic culture. I'm not going to go into detail on this framework, but it specifies 20 competences divided into four main categories, values, attitudes, skills, knowledge, and critical understanding. What I think is really interesting is if you look at this, there is a very strong link in each of these four categories to the question of languages and culture. Let me just highlight those elements within the four categories. This link between quality language education and a culture of democracy has in fact always been part of the Council of Europe's philosophy on languages. Perhaps it's been taken for granted. Perhaps it's been misunderstood or ignored. In any case, it's time to strengthen that link again. And this is in part what the new recommendation hopes to achieve. I think it's worthwhile for all of us to take time to think through that relationship between language, plurilingual and intercultural education and democratic culture. If it's not immediately obvious to us, then what does that say for teachers and in particular for language teachers? How far do they understand that they have a role to play in a far bigger agenda? So we've looked at the rationale. Let's turn now to the key features of the recommendation itself. This really is the first holistic recommendation in the field of language education. It presents this student-centered vision of language learning with language at the heart of all learning, and it encompasses all languages all educational sectors and all actors. And when I say all languages, I mean not just those present in any curriculum, but those present in extracurricular activities and in wider society, irrespective of their status. It covers, as I said, all sectors, vocational, formal, non-formal, and all levels from preschool right through to higher education, but it goes beyond education into the workplace and into wider society. And it is very ambitious. There's no denying that. I think, however, that it is realistic because it sets out a vision for us all to strive towards. But at the same time, it recognises that every country, every region, perhaps every school has its own particular context. And these differences need to be taken into account. We're all starting from different places. It also offers a lot of support for implementation through the explanatory memorandum, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. 
and it encourages and values every small step taken. And I think that's important to stress. We can't change everything overnight, but we can make small changes and little by little, um, we will be able to achieve our vision. It's also non-dogmatic. At no point in the recommendation does it say, this is the correct methodology. These are the languages you should be teaching in your schools. It leaves you in your context to decide what's best for your learners. So how did we go about developing the recommendation and how did we ensure the involvement of our member states? On this next slide is just very briefly the dates and the stages. There was the creation of a working group made up of the Secretariat, both from Strasbourg and from Graz, and of experts in the field of language education. This was endorsed by the steering committee. The drafting group was then established, met predominantly online because COVID arrived to spoil our plans. Um, and within that drafting group, there was the creation of a small subgroup, sorry, within the ad hoc group, the creation of a smaller um, drafting group. The lead writer in the drafting group was Professor David Little, and uh, I believe he's, he's online with us tonight. And uh, David will be taking forward the work on the, the subsequent uh, webinars in this series. So I'm not going to go into the details, but you can see that, in fact, the process was actually relatively quick. Um, those of you who know about the development of recommendations will know that others have taken a lot longer. And we were delighted that by February 22, this had been adopted by the Committee of Ministers following discussions within the Rapporteur Group for the Committee of Ministers focusing on education. This is just my opinion, but I feel, having been involved in the ad hoc group and then directly in the drafting group, that there really was a rich exchange with member states. The drafts were presented at various meetings, they were sent by email, there was a lot of opportunity for comment, and the, the feedback we received was very, very rich and helpful. It really guided the work of the drafting group and the wider ad hoc group. And it's at this point that I would like to ask one of my colleagues, um, Ursula Newby, who was part of that ad hoc working group, to give us her perspective on the development process. Thank you, Ursula. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, yes, at the time uh, of uh, these meetings, I was president of the uh, governing board of the ECML, and in this capacity took part in uh, this uh, ad hoc group. As uh, Sarah has already highlighted, it was a, a hugely uh, intensive uh, way of working together with a lot of um, exchange between experts of, uh, <clears throat> of all aspects of uh, language education and uh, especially uh, working together with the secretariats uh, of the two organizations in Strasbourg and uh, the ECML in Graz. And, um, and the representatives of uh, the, uh, the two uh, governing bodies was uh, extremely well uh, organized and uh, also um, it, uh, all the expertise of the various parties were um, valued uh, in a really appreciative uh, sense. I felt that uh, the combination of the strategic uh, expertise of the um, education department, uh, especially concerning the uh, format and the process of uh, developing such a recommendation, combined uh, with the uh, content and subject expertise of the ECML uh, in uh, Graz was uh, a hugely successful uh, combination and it really enriched uh, the working uh, together. And as um, um, Sarah said, um, in various stages uh, of this process, uh, all the member states uh, were uh, involved, uh, encouraged to give feedback, and also uh, to um, communicate uh, between 
the members of the two governing boards, which uh, made sure that there was only one uh, feedback from each country, and that was in, in, in itself a very successful uh, process. So I can only uh, testify that this was a very um, enriching way of working together and uh, partly uh, was uh, also led to the uh, success of uh, uh, finishing it in such a short uh, time. Thank you very much, um, Ursula. Um, Claire, est-ce que tu voudrais commenter? Claire, would you like to make a comment? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the possibility of expressing the French point of view on this uh, highly political text of the Council of Europe and the ECML has uh, had a part to play, has been fortunate enough to contribute as uh, uh, has been explained to us. Of course, for us, this text is uh, a considerable uh, progress because it deals with a language policy which has to be reinforced in Europe. We are absolutely convinced of that. It uh, has to uh, remain a, a policy respecting all languages in Europe um, in this time of change, change of paradigm, uh, I would say. Uh, as to languages, it is certainly true. Uh, languages is one of the fields uh, uh, which has to do directly with life, and there is the life of languages, which is one of the fields important for us, but it's not the only one. We were very much aware um, uh, of the work that has been carried out in order to uh, arrive at the final text, which is highly satisfactory as far as we are con concerned, because it states a balanced, it strikes the right balance between uh, plurilingualism and multilingualism. We know that plurilingualism is not always interpreted in the same way uh, in various parts of the world or in various fields. And there we've reached uh, uh, the right balance. And uh, plurilingualism is being described as the capacity to speak and understand several languages uh, for an individual uh, being in a receptive competence, uh, partly or not. And so I can only commend you for this uh, work. And now this text has to be disseminated because it's quite fantastic to have arrived at such a recommendation. But of course, what is going to happen now? This text, will it stay in a drawer at the Council of Europe and at the ECML, or shouldn't this recommendation be disseminated at all level, uh, especially at national level in France? And that is what we're going to do. We're going to uh, endeavor to disseminate this text. And the webinar this afternoon will certainly contribute to a better dissemination of the text. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, I think it's very helpful to have these statements from, from member states on, on their involvement in the process. Um, and I really do believe that that help, will help to foster a sense of ownership um, from, from the member states. So I'm now going to turn to the different elements within the recommendation without spending too much time on detail. <laughs> Let's begin with the preamble. And I'll just let you have a second to read that text. I'm not going to read it out. What's the purpose of the preamble? Well, it's really that. It's about setting it into the context, everything that's been agreed before. But I would suggest that when it comes to official documents, there's a risk that it's the part of the text that might be overlooked because you're trying to find the new part, you're trying to get to the, to the key messages. But actually, it's a very important part because all of these references constitute a considerable body, a considerable acquis 
that the recommendation draws on and it reminds member states of all that they've adopted before, perhaps forgotten. Why have I highlighted the element in pink? Well, I mentioned at the beginning, I was trying to differentiate between the Council of Europe and the European Union, because sometimes there, there is confusion. But actually, um, synergies are very, very important. And here we looked at the 2019 European Council recommendation on a comprehensive approach to language teaching and learning. Um, and really, we believe that the Council of Europe recommendation builds on this, that there are clear synergies between these two recommendations. And I think for countries, that's very, very important that the same signals are coming, broadly the same signals from the two large European organisations. Following the, the references to all of the official texts, um, within the preamble, there's a series of very concise phrases which remind us of what we've already acknowledged as fact, the basis on which the recommendation builds. These little phrases are actually very powerful. They begin with words such as recognizing, reaffirming, and they spell out in, in succinct ways what previous commitments we've made and why it's really important that we develop socially inclusive and peaceful European societies and the role of language education within all of that. And I will return to those phrases um, later um, as a source of inspiration for implementing the recommendation. So that's the first part, the preamble. And then come the specific recommendations, perhaps a little bit confusing. It's a recommendation, but within the recommendation, there is a section listing some specific recommendations. And here they are for you on the screen. There's a little preface to this list of specific recommendations, and I'll read it out to you. Taking due account of national, regional and or local circumstances and in conformity with constitutional provisions. I think that's very important because here the Council of Europe is recognising that laws are different in different countries, but it's also recognising that each country, each region, each institution has to think about what's right for them and what's right for, for their learners, but all still try striving towards the global vision. It is absolutely clear that the overall responsibility for implementing the recommendation lies with public authorities, governments in principle. But as you can see here, it's very clear too that they cannot do it on their own. Each of us has a role to play. And perhaps this is something that we need to think about. We need to reach out um, and establish cooperation um, with other parts of society. And then comes the appendix. In some ways, it's the main part of the recommendation. It summarizes the purpose, it explains the scope, who's it, who's it for, what languages does it cover, etc. It defines some key terms. It sets out the principles that underpin plurilingual and intercultural education for democratic culture. I won't look at those in too much detail today, but they will form the basis for the series of upcoming webinars. These principles will help guide us as we put the recommendation into practice. And it also elaborates the measures, exactly what needs to be done and by whom. And there, within those measures, there really is an important focus on teacher development, both initial um, and continuing development. And again, just as I mentioned before, it does say this is very ambitious, but it also says you can make small changes and those small changes can in fact go a long way. And I think it's important to highlight that those small changes could be at the level of policy, they could be at the level of practice, better still at both. And again, about partnership. So let me turn now to the very important part of this webinar, which is 
what happens now? Now you've kind of understood how it's structured, you've understood what the rationale is. How do we now move forward and try and put this recommendation into practice in our different contexts? When it comes to promotion and dissemination, this really is a joint responsibility. And when I say joint, I mean member states and, of course, the Council of Europe and as part of the Council of Europe, the ECML. It can be done in simple ways. First of all, have you let your stakeholders know that this recommendation um, has been adopted? Have you published it? Have you put it on your website? Have you included a little news article, perhaps in any kind of official newsletter you might have? We have one on our website. It's a short and simple text, which you could easily translate. And then it links people to the full text of the recommendation and the explanatory memorandum. And just to let you know what we have done, of course, we immediately published a news item and we published it both on the ECML's website and on the website of the Education Department in Strasbourg. And since then, we have created a dedicated website where we will be uploading translations um, as, as they are done. And I'm not sure that my colleague from Norway knows that his translation is already there, but it is. Um, so I would just like to hand the floor over to Steiner um, to ask him, why did Norway decide to translate the recommendation? Thank you, Steiner. Thank you very much. Uh, let's start, I think that many, many Norwegians would be able to read the English or even the French uh, uh, text. So that was not actually the, the main uh, reason for doing so. Um, we had, uh, when I go back, we had a, a huge impact from outside uh, when it came to developing new, a kind of new language policy uh, in 2001 uh, from the Council of Europe, from the European Union, the year of, of, of languages, which led to a new strategy in Norway, to lead to an establishment of a national center uh, to discussions in Norway. What should we do with foreign language uh, policy? So when I uh, got to, to, to know about this, I uh, immediately thought that this is going to be exactly as important at that time. So this is uh, an, an important thing for us to, to focus on. Secondly, uh, when I uh, read the text and I had all, already read, the, of course, uh, the EU recommendation, uh, what I really liked about it was this coming a little bit with away from the quantity to the quality, because we had a lot of focus on how many languages should we uh, learn. We, of course, know the, the one plus two dogma uh, without actually asking ourselves how much do we uh, and how well do we need to, to, to master different languages. So that was the second reason for focusing on, on uh, the recommendation. Thirdly, as I'm also professor of languages, uh, I know that we uh, have a different uh, tradition in different uh, languages. So I thought it is also very important for us to have a kind of common understanding of terminology. So when I found out that this is also in the appendix, uh, kind of uh, definitions, I thought this is going to be even more interesting, not only for the decision makers, but also for the teacher educators, for teachers and, and everybody. And fourthly, I have to be honest with you, uh, due to the pandemic, we had money <laughs> to do so. Uh, and, of course, this was an excellent uh, way of spending 
the money that we couldn't use for other uh, activities. I, I will have to say that, uh, of course, we know that the translation is not enough. So we will follow up in on the 26th of September with a national conference when, where we will have focus on the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Steiner. Um, and Steiner has, has nicely moved us, in fact, to the next part of, of the webinar because promotion and dissemination is just the beginning. Um, but what do we do to really start thinking about implementation? I think one of the best ways to use the recommendation is to take elements from the text um, not to expect people to digest the entirety of, of the text, but to take elements from them from the text and use these as springboards for discussion. Now, of course, there isn't time this afternoon, this, this evening to go into detail, but I'd like to give you some suggestions, some tips of ways that you might um, want to think about stimulating discussion in your context. And I'll start by looking at elements from the preamble. Please note that I have selected elements, so you're not seeing the text in its entirety, and um, any um, difference in colour or highlighting is, is, is my own. I mentioned these phrases that come after the big long list of conventions and charters and recommendations, etc., that are in the preamble. I think these are a wonderful way to begin any kind of, of discussion. Let's just look at that first one. Recognizing the cognitive, linguistic and societal benefits of learning a range of languages and the disadvantages for learners who have access to only one additional language. What might you do with that in your own context? I suggest that you take these little parts of the text and turn them into questions. So what are the benefits? Can you enumerate them? Can your teachers enumerate them? Can parents in your schools understand and talk about the benefits of learning a range of languages? But what about the disadvantages? Think about them too, and perhaps ask some, of, some learners in your context who've only had access to one other language. Has this been detrimental to them? So that's just something you could start with. I think that little word also is actually quite devious in that sentence because it really is revealing of something. Recognizing that plurilingual and intercultural education also supports the educational and social inclusion of migrant and marginalized um, learners. For many years, there's been a myth going around that plurilingual education is for migrants. Plurilingual education is for those who don't speak the language of schooling. And that little word also is saying, uh -uh, this is beneficial to all learners. And there is very much a focus on inclusion. So how about debating that in your context? What does that mean? In what ways does it support learners who are not migrant or marginalized? And in what ways does it support those particular learners? What about this one? Recognizing that the digital environment provides an unprecedented means for people to express themselves using different languages and opens new opportunities to enhance language learning, etc. I won't read the entire sentence. Think about your context. What's happened since COVID? What is the situation, first of all, in terms of digital infrastructure in your schools or in your universities or other learning institutions? What have we learned about blended learning? What have we learned about the advantages of digital learning? And while there's often arguments about space on timetable for different languages, there are challenges around teacher supply 
in different languages? How could you use extracurricular activities? How could you use spaces in the school to give learners access to tools in different languages to develop their competences in languages that are not on the curriculum? I think there's a lot there for decision makers um, to think about. So that's just a couple of examples from the preamble. And here's one from the definitions. Now, of course, it's the definition, the complex definition of plurilingual and intercultural education. I'm not going to spend much time on this because this really is something that will be picked up um, in the subsequent webinar. But this question of integrated linguistic repertoires, what does that mean for you if you have a role as a decision maker? Do teachers of different languages have an opportunity to work together? Do they have a joint curriculum? How do they make sure that the learning that's taking place within their classroom is actually being carried over into the learning in another language classroom? So it's just a question to put to you. The language of schooling, genre and terminology, different subjects. The language of schooling has been a big agenda item for the Council of Europe for, for many, many years now. There was, of course, the 2014 recommendation on the importance of competences in the language of schooling. Is it a priority in your context? What professional opportunities do your teachers have teachers of other subjects and um, not, not of languages. How responsible do they feel for supporting the linguistic development of their learners? And what support and resources do, do they have? But maybe an even more pertinent question when we think about the language of schooling, a lot of advances have been made in this field and many, many countries are aware um, of the challenges. But sometimes inadvertently, the focus on the language of schooling has led to that myth reappearing that other languages in the classroom need to be kept out because we need to focus on the language of schooling. And it's time to look at that myth again and to bust it and to think to yourselves, if you're doing that, you're leaving part of your learners outside the classroom. That doesn't mean, of course, that you do not put emphasis on the language itself, but there are ways and means of, of doing so. So I think that definition alone um, may help you begin some discussions. What about the principles? Again, I mentioned these will be um, looked at in more detail in subsequent webinars, but I just wanted to take one that you might think about to start discussions. Why not begin a discussion on what you believe to be the purpose of education? I think there's hugely differing opinions on what we all think education is about in any one context, let alone if we start to compare across contexts. As I mentioned before, for the Council of Europe, it goes beyond preparation for the labour market. How is that reflected in your curricula in schools or, or in universities? And does it contribute to the development of a democratic culture? So that would be just one suggestion from, um, from the principles. But what about the measures? I've taken some of the measures from the section on policy and practice. Review existing policies. In, in our governing board discussions this morning, we were talking about reform and review and renewal, and it's hard work. We all know it's hard work. But maybe this recommendation is the opportunity to say, let's look afresh at the policies we have. Let's see what we can do um, to, to update them or to change them. And if I can just give you an example from from my own home context, um, from, from Scotland, there are a number of language policies. There's a policy for um, ESOL, for English for speakers of other languages. There's a, pol a policy for foreign languages. There's a policy for Scots and for Gaelic. There's a policy for literacy. My question 
there, and it's a question I imagine affects other countries, is how do these policies talk to each other? How do they interlink? Um, and how do we ensure that people working to try and implement these policies understand that they're not working alone, that there, that there are other policies to, to consider? So that's just a possible suggestion for you. And here's another one. We talked about at least two languages. Claire mentioned the importance of being able to develop competences in several languages. There's the part that we've mentioned before about these interrelating, but there's also this idea about authentic progression, progressively complex oral and written communication. We need to be careful we're not paying lip service um, to language competences. Being able to say a few words is maybe fine for going on holiday, um, but there, there it stops. And what are we doing? Is there clear progression? Um, in our curricula and how are we supporting learners on their individual learning pathways to mark out and plot their own progression. And that takes us to topics around um, formative assessment, the European language portfolio, etc., which can perhaps be picked up in subsequent webinars. And then there's another one here about possibly providing certification. Hugely difficult, hugely complex, but we do have some wonderful examples, um, for example, from Norway, um, the option for learners to get certification in their home languages. And there are examples um, for other countries, such as that one, that can, um, can be followed. And what about this one? Reflecting on traditional linguistic hierarchies. What do we mean by that? What are the hierarchies? Are there hierarchies? Sometimes, again, they're, they're there, but perhaps hidden. What languages are you offering in your schools and in your universities? Could the offer be broadened? Could you consider bringing in other languages? And of course, there are resource issues, teacher capacity issues, etc. But we all have a responsibility to think about this and think about how we might be able to improve the situation. I'm conscious of time um, and I am moving towards the end. You'll, you'll be very relieved, I think, to hear. So what about support? What about support from the Council of Europe and as part of the Council of Europe from the ECML? The first thing is the explanatory memorandum. I mentioned to you that not all recommendations have an explanatory memorandum, it's an optional part, but we believed as we were developing this recommendation that it's an extremely helpful part. Um, and if you just take that explanatory memorandum, it, there's barely an element of the recommendation that isn't linked to an existing Council of Europe resource. It may be a publication, it may be an ECML training and consultancy activity, but there's plenty there. I've just put on the screen a couple of examples. And of course, links to the wealth of resources produced by our colleagues in Strasbourg. And these resources you can find on the language policy portal. And I've just added a few visuals to, to jazz up the slide. But there's plenty in there and plenty for you to explore. It really is a, a treasure chest. And it's interesting because when we developed it, of course, we didn't include ongoing ECML projects. We felt it was important only to include finalised outputs. But the links to the thematic areas will now take you to the newer developments produced by the Council of Europe. So that's the first way in which we as the Council of Europe can offer you support. The second way, of course, is through a webinar such as tonight's and the subsequent series of webinars. And I'll mention a few things about that series in, in one second. And of course, um, raising awareness, not just through publication, but as Steiner mentioned, through conferences. Um, through inviting Council of Europe staff members or any of the experts involved to come and speak at conferences um, in your country um, and really get the message across around the recommendation. 
And we at the ECML will be using this recommendation as the broad frame for the development of our next programme. And this is something we will look at more closely tomorrow within the governing board. So I just wanted to conclude um, before opening the floor for any comments um, or questions by looking at what, what's next, what's next when it comes to um, the webinars. And in order to think about the content and the focus of these future webinars, we're going to use the scope section of the recommendation. If you look at the scope, as I mentioned before, all of these education stakeholders, so we could have webinars focusing on a particular stakeholder group, such as, for example, teacher educators. I think that's one that would be very much appreciated. We can also think about webinars that focus in on a particular sector, for example, primary, preschool and primary, or vocational, etc., or the non-formal um, sector, because each sector has its own specific challenges. And that will give us an opportunity to go into more depth on the resources and the support available. And another approach would be to focus on particular dimensions of language learning or re related to language learning that appear in the recommendation. Of course, the language of schooling, minority and migrant languages, CLIL, bilingual education, learner autonomy, the learner voice. What does that mean for practice, language, practice in the language classroom? What does it mean for teacher education? What does it mean for the development of policy. So there are many, many aspects um, to that. The big question, of course, of digital literacy and the other one around assessment literacy. Thinking very much now about um, formative assessment, alternative assessment, online assessment, all of the things that have emerged as a result of the pandemic. And with that, um, I would like to, to draw my input to a close, um, just to say to you that the plan is that the first um, in the, the first, the second <coughs> webinar, sorry, we hope to organise around the European Day of Languages. We have still to fix um, a date um, and it's most likely to be led by Professor David Little. Um, and that one will look in more detail at what we really mean by plurilingual and intercultural education. So watch out for the announcement. It will be on our website um, and we will spread the word as far as we can. Thank you very, very much for listening. Um, I'm not sure. I hope perhaps there might be some comments or questions in either English or French from the people here in the room or for, from anyone online. Thank you. Here's a really challenging one. How do the principles and measures relate to social sustainability? I think I'm going to give that to you as your homework. <laughs> Maria, it's a very, very interesting question. Um, I think when we talk about sustainability, we're talking about democratic and socially cohesive societies. And if you look at those principles, they're about developing competences that will help us develop a more democratic society, which in turn results in social inclusion and sustainability. But that is a very, very challenging question. And perhaps it's one um, that we all need to think about um, a little bit more. But thank you very much for the question, um, Maria. Are there any other questions? I'm not sure I fully understand this question. How to use the scope of the recommendation to digital transition and language policy? 
I'll do my best to, 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 to reply, Maria, but I'm not 100% sure of exactly what you mean. The scope of the recommendation covers all sectors, all players, and all aspects of language education, of which digital transitions and digital uh, literacy is key, um, as is the question of policy. Um, so if you, if you look at the scope and then you turn from the scope to the measures, you will see that there are a number of elements focusing on policy, and that's both national policy, school policy, institutional policy as well, and the whole question of um, digital transitions. Transition is a very important word because the scope covers preschool right through to the workplace. Um, and those points of transition um, are very, very important. Um, I'm not sure you maybe know about it, Maria, but the ECML currently has a very interesting project looking at CLIL in languages other than, than English and focusing specifically on the challenges around transitions. So from pre-primary to primary, primary to secondary. So I would encourage you to, to take a look at that resource. Are there any other questions or comments from our online participants or the participants in the room? Please, uh, Panagiotis and then Claire. Thank you very much. Actually, just a slight comment. This was such an impressive presentation. I think driving towards the future, towards sustainability in the future. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Panagiotis. Claire, s'il te plaît. Thanks indeed, Sarah. So I can also add to the thanks expressed by the Greek colleague already, and my question rather is on the roadmap of the ECML. Will the ECML or will the Council of Europe maybe follow this approach? Will they follow the outcome and implementation of this recommendation? Because we will try to measure the take up of the recommendation in the member states of the Council of Europe and maybe even beyond. Thanks indeed, Claire. And this is indeed a very important question. I have not made reference to this in my presentation, but basically, yes, we will certainly have a follow up of the recommendation, but maybe not as regards the uh, implementation, but it's rather on the level of the uh, governing board in Strasbourg. And from time to time, we will ask the member states what they do, what they have done already, and how the Council of Europe can offer some uh, assistance there. So it's a follow-up, but it's not a follow-up which can be measured precisely. I think the responsibility for measuring this, that it's is certainly for the national authorities. And I'm using the possibility for a second question. Do we have today a list of languages taught in the member states of the Council of Europe? Does such a tool exist, which would certainly help us and come with some advantages as to language policies? Should such a tool or does such a tool exist? And if that isn't the case, we could maybe envisage sooner or later to create such a thing, kind of a list or inventory of all languages taught in the member states. Presently, this does not exist. And as far as I know, it has never been asked for. But I do believe that, for instance, Euridis, Euridis of, the, of the European Union do such work. And if I'm right, they are just publishing a new version. But this, of course, only applies to the member states of the European Union. 
So as to your question, could one envisage such a tool? I believe that this should be discussed on the level of the steering committee for education in order to see whether there is interest in such a thing on behalf of the member states. But presently, if I'm right, such a thing does not exist. For improving lingual education, uh, I imagine uh, a lot of teacher training will be needed because we are talking about new approaches, new ways of seeing the educational process. So do you know if there are any uh, teacher trainer um, programs uh, or institutions that can already um, offer um, kind of training uh, in, uh, in a way to um, uh, um, raise awareness and give um, knowledge of um, strategies to, to do to uh, uh, educate uh, in a way, in a plurilingual way in the classroom. Thank you for the question, Bronka. Um, I think if you look at the range of offers within ECML training and consultancy, you'll already find there um, a, no a number of aspects um, of plurilingual education. And of course, when we start to develop our new programme, perhaps this is the opportunity to think about what other offers could we add um, in terms of training and consultancy, which is our way of, of providing um, support for, for teachers and, and teacher educators. So I think there's a lot there. I think what we need to do now is make sure that we present a complete package um, and that member states understand um, what is the added value of the different elements in training and consultancy and how these all contribute um, to the implementation of the recommendation. But you've made me think of something very important. Yes, this is a vision. Yes, this is ambitious. But a lot is already happening. We're not starting completely from scratch. And it's not about throwing the baby out with the bathwater either. Um, so don't think that you, you know, this is completely new in some countries, particularly, I'm thinking of your own, you've taken up many training and consultancy offers um, at Bronca. So it's a work in progress um, and it's about pooling resources to make sure that we can all help one another um, achieve this important vision for, for society. Thank you. I don't think there's time to um, take any further questions, um, but I know there's been one or two online and we will try and get, get back to the, to the people um, concerned. Um, but thank you very much once again, everyone for, for listening. Um, I hope you found it useful and I hope that I have given you um, just a few ideas, a few pointers for thinking about what you can do now um, in your own particular context. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Au revoir.